In this video, we're going to talk about applying the internal affairs doctrine. We're going to take a look at a famous case, McDermott Inc. v. Lewis, to try to better understand the internal affairs doctrine as it was related to you in the last video. In this lecture, we're going to recall the internal affairs doctrine that you learned previously. Apply the internal affairs doctrine to the facts of the case McDermott Inc. v. Lewis, a Delaware case from 1987, and take a brief look at the reasoning for why the internal affairs doctrine is a good rule of law. The internal affairs doctrine states that a corporation's internal affairs are governed by the law of the state in which it is incorporated. This begs the question, what exactly are internal affairs? Internal affairs predominantly relate to matters of voting of shareholders or suing of directors for breach of fiduciary duties and a few other procedures regarding corporate actions. In general, the internal affairs of a corporation regard the relationship between the corporation, its officers, directors, and shareholders. This was material from the previous lesson. Now let's apply it to a case. McDermott Inc. v. Lewis is a Delaware case that asked which law governs a corporation's internal affairs. We already know the answer is the law of the state in which it is incorporated, but this case will help us to see why. And the facts here are a bit confusing, so I'm going to help walk you through them briefly. In this case, we had a corporate reorganization. In other words, the corporation had a fundamental change of structure. Just as background, these type of reorganizations are extraordinary events. They don't happen every day. And extraordinary events require shareholder approval. So let's take a look at what happened in McDermott v. Lewis. Previous to the reorganization, we had a public company, McDermott Delaware, which, of course, is owned by its shareholders. And McDermott Delaware, in turn, owned McDermott International a business that dealt with oil and gas services to the marine construction industry. The corporation determined to reorganize, and here's what happened afterwards. A little bit confusing, but let me walk you through this. The most important thing to note is that effectively, McDermott International and McDermott Delaware switched places. McDermott Delaware in the previous situation was the parent. In other words, it owned McDermott Delaware. After the reorganization, the roles have flipped. McDermott International becomes the parent, and McDermott Delaware is the subsidiary. Now the shareholders, which previously owned McDermott Delaware, own McDermott International. And there are a few remaining public shareholders that were not happy about this merger, and they continued to own McDermott Delaware. It is those shareholders, those that were dissenting and unhappy with this decision, that are of issue in this case. Take a careful look at the numbers, the percentages of the shareholders. It's important to note that McDermott Delaware, after the reorganization, owns 10% of McDermott International. In other words, McDermott owns shares in itself. Take a careful look. McDermott International owns McDermott Delaware, and McDermott Delaware owns shares of McDermott International. It's a little bit circular. And herein lies the problem. In the jurisdiction of Panama, a subsidiary can vote the shares of its parent. This is not the case in Delaware. This is what we call a conflict of law. If the subsidiary owns parent shares in a U.S. jurisdiction such as Delaware, these shares can't vote. But in Panama, they can. And so this 10% makes a big difference because, as you'll notice, 10% is more than 8%, so guess who wins that contest? The conflict of law was in particular between Delaware General Corporation Law Section 160C and Panamanian law that, according to expert opinion, allowed a majority-owned subsidiary to vote its parent stock. On the other hand, Delaware law, and for that matter, Almost all U.S. corporate law in all states does not permit a subsidiary to vote its parent stock. So there is a conflict of law regarding the voting of stock. 
The voting of stock is fundamentally an internal affair. It regards the relationship between the corporation and its shareholders. And so we have a conflict of law that pertains to an internal affair. What should the internal affairs doctrine hold? Unsurprisingly, the Delaware courts found that the internal affairs doctrine means that the state of the law of incorporation applies. And that's true here, even where the state of incorporation is Panama. Panamanian law, which permits the subsidiary to vote those shares, must apply. The trial court erred in refusing to apply the laws of Panama to the internal affairs of McDermott. Why is this a good law? There are several reasons. On the left, you see some reasoning that deals with the wisdom, practicality, and fairness of the internal affairs doctrine. On the right, the court brings up the notion that this is a result required by the Constitution. In another video, I'll deal with the Due Process Commerce Clause and Full Faith and Credit Clause reasons for the Internal Affairs Doctrine. For present purposes, note that there are good constitutional reasons why the Internal Affairs Doctrine provides notice, certainty, and fairness. In conclusion, the Internal Affairs Doctrine is a widely accepted choice of law rule. States such as Delaware will apply the Internal Affairs Doctrine even when it means that a different state's law governs the internal affairs of a particular corporation. The Internal Affairs Doctrine holds that a corporation's internal affairs, such as shareholder voting and the lawsuit against directors for breach of directors' duties to the corporation and its shareholders, shall be governed by the law of its state of incorporation. In the McDermott case, Panama law applied because the corporation was Panamanian, and a shareholder vote is an internal affair. Therefore, in McDermott, Panama law should apply to a shareholder vote regarding a Panamanian corporation. The internal affairs doctrine is supported by wisdom, practicality, and equity, and also may be required by the Constitution. In other videos, I'll deal with additional topics, including the specific constitutional bases for the Internal Affairs Doctrine, and California's purported exception to the Internal Affairs Doctrine in its Section 2115 statute. I hope this video helped you understand the application of the Internal Affairs Doctrine.